OK, good evening, everybody. The first thing to do is to welcome everybody here today in the room, but also very importantly, those people who've stayed up very late or perhaps had a couple of hours kick and woken up, particularly for this lecture in Singapore. And I couldn't be more thrilled, Vicky, to be here today and to introduce your inaugural. So I think what we're going to learn today, what a phenomenal overachiever he is. Uh, and I went through his CV. It was so impressive, but I shall let not steal his thunder, but it, it's going to become apparent. But on a personal level, I would like to say what a pleasure it's been to get to know you over my time at St George's. You have been a wonderful colleague and actually you've been incredibly friendly towards me and I want on a personal level to thank you very much for that. We sort of bonded, you stopped me in that rather luxurious corridor with lecture theatres A, B and C on it and he says, don't you know Singapore? And I said, I do. And he said, I go back and forth to Singapore the whole time. And so then we had quite a detailed conversation about managing jet lag, the best part of the airport, the various <laughs> foods and other things to enjoy in Singapore. And what is amazing about all your achievements is that you've managed to continue exemplary progress, both in Asia and in London, which I think is remarkable. So we're going to hear a lot more of the detail to come. After you've given your inaugural lecture, I'm very pleased to say that we have Ted, Professor Ted Gordon-Smith here. And I've learned something today, having seen the walk, that it's so lovely to meet you here today. Still alive. <laughs> <laughs> I'm still alive, at least for the next hour. Now, it is wonderful that you've come to give uh, sign up, I hope, to the lecture, and then I will close proceedings. So I think without further ado, we'd like to invite you up, Mickey, to please kindly give your inaugural lecture. Thank you, Jenny, for those very kind words. Um, when I was preparing for this talk, um, the, the main thing that, that really kind of settled me was um, when they said that I couldn't move from this lectern and I stay still because that's where the camera was pointing. And anyone who knows me knows I cannot stay still for a minute. So could people just kind of gently kind of signal for me to move back to the lectern if I start to deviate from this? <laughs> anyway. um, it's nice to see all of you here. I like to see the great and good of uh, St. George's and Med School um, here in uh, full force. Very, very encouraging. Um, I've got to say that uh, we've got, I've got friends here, I've got colleagues here, um, but importantly, I think we've got medical students here, we've got lab staff here, we've got trainees here as well, both from the hospital and the medical school. And I, and I know my Singapore team, um, whom I work with, are awake at 1.30 logging in, so I'm grateful for that. I think that the whole contingent of them, so I promise to acknowledge them, and I think my parents from Singapore also are adopted as well. So let's start. And I think I've got 45 minutes to, to do a lecture. And I wanted this really to kind of try to pitch it at, at many levels. Let's see how I do and let me know at the end. Um, so the title of my talk today is Stem Cells, the Good, the Bad, and Sometimes uh, the Ugly. And I thought that this would be um, an easy and uh, oh, this doesn't move. I thought you know, I wouldn't have to put a Clint Eastwood reference there, but then I was speaking to some of my trainees and none of them knew what the good, the bad, the bad, and the ugly are. I thought, oh my gosh, the current generation, what, what else can you say? But then one very clever trainee did come along and said, ah, I love that film, that's my favourite film, and I thought, gosh, faith is restored in this world finally. <laughs> Anyhow, uh, and, in preparation for this lecture, I, I, I thought I'll do a rather unscientific um, analysis of, of 
what people think stem cells are. And so I asked a couple of people and I tried to kind of include all age groups and I tried to include, you know, uh, uh, people who are non-medical and people uh, uh, who had nothing to do with stem cells. And that's the range of answers that, uh, that, you, that you have. And in some way that really mirrors what you most people would think of stem cells. So on the one hand, I think people think of it as high tech, people think of it as the future and the elixir of youth and the anti-aging that goes with it, and that it's a cure all for cancer as well. But on the other hand, I think there are obviously some bits of concern that come to here. People think of it as um, that, that uh, uh, it could be tinkering with the future and that although it's, it's cutting edge and pioneering, maybe it's a treatment of last resort. And someone did talk about it being tiny and pink. I'm not so sure about that. <laughs> okay, so that's my way of introduction. First of all, um, I wanted to kind of draw everybody back and really talk about what a proven stem cell therapy is. I, I think we're all so consumed and concerned, I think, these days with different types of amazing stem cells that can do all sorts of things to you. And I will cover some of them in my, in my lecture in due time. But let me bring you back to something that we've been doing for many, many years as hematologists and is a proven stem cell therapy. And that really is bone marrow transplant. And this was pioneered in the 50s by the French uh, uh, when, when patients were accidentally exposed to high-dose radiation. And they realized that by giving a bone marrow back from somebody else, they could rescue these individuals. At that time, the, the, the term, the specific term stem cell was still not coined. And so people just thought that, you know, it, it, people knew that there must be something that was replacing the marrow and getting the, the, that functioning again in, 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 in these patients. And it was only in the 60s when, when two Canadians, Till and McCulloch, um, isolated the hematopoietic stem cell. And that stem cell, they showed produced every single cell in, in, in your hematopoietic system. So your red cells, your white cells, your platelets, but also the surrounding tissue in the bone marrow we call the stromal cells that gives rise to your cartilage, fat, and connective tissue. So that, in this, that really probably is the beginning of what I would say stem cell biology and, and stem cell science. And the Canadians have always emphasized quite a bit, I think, on stem cell biology. And, and uh, 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 someone later called John Dick did a lot of work also on, 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 on hematopoietic stem cells. As we, as we progressed in the field, we also learned that stem cells did not well, they came from the bone marrow, but we could also collect them quite easily from the peripheral blood by just giving a certain hormone. And so that was called peripheral blood stem cells. And then I think many of you would also know that umbilical cord contains stem cells as well, and we do use this in transplant. So a more umbrella term has then since developed, and we call this hematopoietic stem cell transplant. I shall refer to this uh, henceforth HSCT. And no longer do we have to rely on hours in the operating theater. Come on, it's informal. <laughs> um, try to extract bone marrow uh, and, and hoping this would work. We collect this from apheresis. And just for the non-medical around you, when we talk about hematopoietic stem cell, we're talking about an early progenitor stem cell that is able to pro proliferate and differentiate into all the cell types that we do know about. And if you fast forward to now, it's really routine practice. And, and bone marrow transplants or HSTTs are now really almost first line in some hematological cancers, but has now extended its reach into even neurological diseases like multiple sclerosis and uh, uh, sickle cell anemia. And I'll deal with those uh, a little later. What about other stem cells? So this is the bit that I, I think the media are interested in. This is the bit that's always in the news. And there are other types of stem cells that have been discovered, stem cells that come from your fat, stem cells that, that come from the bone marrow stroma. They are called mesenchymal stem cells, although many people still think that these are not true stem cells. But we do know that there is a hierarchical layer of stem cells so that they go from a totipotent stem cell, which by itself can form the entire fetus. 
and 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 so it, it you know from one cell you can get everything and then as you differentiate slightly you then become pluripotent where you can't form the whole uh, a fetus itself, but you can differentiate into lots of different tissues, be they cardiac tissue, neuro tissue, immune tissue. And then as you start to differentiate, and in some ways as you get older, then you lose the ability to proliferate and you lose that stem cellness about it. Okay. And as I mentioned in Canada, there's a lot of work looking at this, and that was in John uh, uh, by John Dick. And you know, whenever you talk about a, a stem cell that renews itself, a stem cell that can change into anything, that immediately comes with a whole sense of, uh, of ex expectation that is going to regenerate tissue, is going to be involved in anti-aging. And so we've got the whole elixir of life and, and the co cosmetic industry that developed around them. Uh, and I think some of you will know I'm a, I'm a, a huge uh, a film uh, buff, so I always try to kind of include film references. That's probably one of the best examples of um, stems of, of kind of elixir of life in a film. So go watch that. Um, <laughs> And clearly the media are fascinated as well and fascinated by what stem cells can do. And I'm sure some of you might have also read recently about, you know, a father having his son's uh, blood, young blood kind of infused into him because that apparently is anti-aging as well. So clearly people are looking for younger and younger cells in an effort to, 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 to try to, make, to, to, to look younger. And so it has given rise really to this whole industry of unproven cell therapies, which I will also attempt to talk about. And there is increasing interest to use this clinically, and there is justifiable scientific reason to use this. And I must say there is great promise associated with stem cell therapy. And I think we are there and almost there about to leap into the exponential phase. And all of this is really called cell therapy. So anything that you use a cell-based a, a, a product as a medicinal product as a pharmaceutical product is therefore called cell therapy, cellular therapy, and I rather prefer the word cell-based therapeutics. And if you think about it, we're so used in medicine to dealing with drugs. And we know drugs on this table, you see, you know, drugs are simple in that they are consistent. When you get one gram of paracetamol, you know what you're dealing with. They have been sterilized during production and you don't have to worry about infectious issues. And each pill is identical to the next. That's entirely different when you're dealing with cell-based medicine because inherent into every individual cell is a variability. We, we deal with this even in, the, in, in, in blood transfusion, and I'll go to that a little bit later. But nonetheless, at the end of the day, you need your product to be living. So you cannot sterilize it, you can't autoclave it, and you need to maintain viability. And they are unique tissues which are variable across different people. And therefore, sometimes when you test them, when you assign them what you think is their potency or what their product characteristic is, it can be difficult because it, it's it, you are asked to follow the same principles as the, the, the pharma or the drug uh, 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 pathway, but it may not be. And so even very early on in 2011 or 12, I think uh, we asked the question, is cell therapy, uh, is the promise fulfilled then? And for those, I, I know some of you work in transfusion, and I always champion transfusion. I, I always tell people that transfusion, at the end of the day, is your first example of cell-based therapy. And that was done more than 100 years ago. And clearly, in that era, all they did was stick one needle in one arm of the patient and the other needle into your donor, and blood flew from one to the other. And that's where we've advanced. So we, 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 have a, we, we have come a long way, and, and I think we're making substantial progress, but I think we should always remember that that's when transfusion and cell-based therapy really came about. This is the embarrassing bit. I, I, I've always been, <laughs> I've always been told that in all the lectures, you should do things, you know, you should shoot personal pictures. I've never shown the army photo to anybody in my life, so. <laughs> So this is the point, and for good reasons. Um, I graduated from the National University of Singapore, and I'm very proud that my classmate um, from 35 years ago is here today. He's a professor of liver imaging at the Royal Marsden, and we came to, to London almost about the same time, and I think we've stayed on uh, uh, here as well. And, and talking to him all, to, to Darmo, you know, you'll learn how, I think when we came, Singapore really was, was 
trying to kind of develop its biomedical industry. And, and, and so 30 years down the line, it, it has made huge uh, uh, progress. But anyway, so we graduated. That's the, the class. We had a huge class of 200. that still meets for reunions ever so often. And then I had to serve three years of mandatory national service. You can imagine what that did to me. <laughs> <laughs> the day after, I, I, I think what the, day, I, the day I left the army was was um, was the day I left for the UK. <laughs> I thought I needed a break and I needed to kind of get my 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 my, uh, 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 my, my kind of brain clear from the army. Um, but anyway, this, this although having said that, I did serve two years as a medical officer there. But that was us uh, at the um, officer training course. Um, so effectively, I am supposed to be a captain in the army. <laughs> Anyhow, that's all done with. Um, so I came to England, I kind of fresh eye, and, and and then I chose hematology, and people ask why, and it seems simple to me now thinking about it, although I, I do remember when I was young, kind of, you know, debating over again, should I be a surgeon, should I be a gastroenterology, I was interested in, uh, in ENT as well, but hematology in the end attracted me, and I think hematology at that time was coming into its own, because molecular medicine was coming uh, about, and, and, and a lot of discoveries, uh, um, cutting-edge discoveries, I think, were, were, were heading its way through hematology, including transplants. And I particularly like the combination of the clinical environment that you could work also in the laboratory, and then the molecular medicines uh, uh, bits were coming up. And then you had a diverse range of blood transfusion, you could do clotting, you could do rare diseases, you could do congenital diseases, you could do malignant diseases like oncology. And I felt that with that, it gave me sufficient scope for someone like me with clearly an attention deficit to kind of plow my energy into lots of different things before I discovered what, what I liked. Um, and that was in the mid 90s and I trained at the Royal Free, which I think at that time uh, was probably the largest uh, transplant center in the UK. Um, and I started to be interested in transplants then um, and, and specifically the immunology of it. And if you look at that graph here, which shows the rates of transplants over the years, um, you will see that actually it only took off in the 1990s. So it, as with all novel therapies, you go through a long period you know, of gestation and of problems and, and, and of facing issues of whether it should be standard of care therapy. And then once it, it passes a certain level or threshold of safety, it then takes off. And you can now just see that it goes on and on and on and on. And, and so I was in that time period, I think, when it, when it seemed really exciting. But I think that we didn't really know fully, I think, what transplants did still then, and we were getting an idea of what it was. Um, and obviously, what was interesting was that, you know, essentially, you were you were dealing with two immune systems because in an allogenic transplant, you are giving a graft stem, you're giving stem cells from either the bone marrow from peripheral blood that contain lots of T cells and lots of immune cells, and you're giving it to the patient. And so essentially, and we talk about this all the time, that we're creating a chimera in the patient. And, and you can imagine the battles that are fought within the body between two immune systems. And that was what was a, a, attracted me to this field. Um, and by that time, uh, we could achieve stable, consistent stem cell engraftment. So that, that problem, I think, was solved. But what we could not solve was this battle of immunity. The battle, the graft was fighting the host of the patient, which is called graft versus host disease. And the other way, and, and the other bit, though, that because the graft contained a very potent immune system, it could also fight off the residual leukemia or the cancer as well. And so the, the immune system, certainly the donor, was doing both good and harm as well, so the good and the bad. And it was also useful in battling infections. So the key really then that that that, that was being asked was what, how could you dissect through these uh, uh, different bits? And if you look at the immune system, and I won't belabor this, but you can see it's made of a whole host of different cells of which really in a transplant setting would be, or certainly I've, I've concentrated really on the T cells and the NK cells. And of course, you've got B cells and dendritic cells for, for, for the rest of you. Um, but we were asking the question, would you, do, is there an optimum number of T cells that you give, a balance of T cells that neither cause too much damage, but also could do good in its immune system? 
And we were asking, could we therefore reduce the amount of conditioning or the chemotherapy that we gave so that it was less toxic? Could we enrich the graft with lots of stem cells and then give back these immune cells in a, in a manner that could improve eradication of tumor, but also fight off infections as well, and not have to deal with the sometimes life-threatening complications of graft versus host disease. So that's the that was what we were asking. And I was very fortunate, I think, and, and Mark is here uh, to work in Mark Lodell's lab at the Royal Free as well. And he had a keen interest in, 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 in NK cells. And so I worked with him for three, uh, well, three or four years, although I'm sure for Mark, it felt more of a lifetime. <laughs> um, and the premise really, as I've said before, was that if you had these donor T cells, could we somehow separate these T cells to those that, that did good and those that did bad? And so we went to lots of fairly high level uh, things at that time, which are, which had just come into the market. I remember these were your flow cytometry cell sorters. Uh, they've clearly uh, uh, been superseded by, by many others, but at that time was really quite new and, and exciting. So I spent most of my PhD really uh, uh, being more and more proficient in flow cytometry. And I think that has helped me quite a lot uh, because the heme lab will tell you that uh, I usually can come in there and, and talk through the flow uh, uh, results with them. And, and we developed a strategy, and, and, and this was really using cell sorting to try to sort out the cells that we thought were useful, retain them in the graph, and then give them back to the patient. And I think at that time, we were one of four other groups that were doing this worldwide. There was one in France and I think two in America. And actually, uh, um, one of this uh, was taken up by a company and ran into a clinical trial with some success. But as with all these things go, some of them became so expensive. The whole graph manipulation that we had to do was so expensive. I think it's it's sort of uh, not practiced as much now. But I think the the... The the PhD certainly gave me some breathing space because you know at that time being a registrar uh, uh, was tougher than it is now <laughs> to my trainees. <laughs> um, but I was fortunate as well. I think uh, I got a lectureship with the MRC and so continued the work. And, and Mark pretty much left me uh, uh, to manage my time. Um, and and I think we we worked quite well together. Um, and, and and I'm sure they've asked Mark now what his kind of memories of me are, um, besides saying that I'm the best PhD student possible. <laughs> I think he will probably mention two things. I think my fussiness about coffee. We used to, <laughs> we used to go down for coffee and uh, he knew exactly that I was particular and fussy about my coffee. And the next thing I think uh, he'll remember was that when we went for our first conference together, when, we, when I had an oral abstract, which ended up being the best abstract, I think, at the conference, um, he woke up one morning to find that I'd ironed my shirt as well as his shirt as well. And he thought, Gosh. <laughs> anyway, uh, so I, I I thank Mark quite a lot for 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 the grounding that he's given me, um, and I think the news has just has been embargoed until today. But but Mark has just been conferred the ICT or the International Society of Cell Therapy Lifetime Achievement Award. So that's a great thing. I think. And Mark, you be pleased to know that it carries on to this day. I'll show you. This would be <laughs> this was your registrar training day. Look who's behind the keyboard. <laughs> oh. I'm sure this contravenes all health and safety. <laughs> but I think the people staff knew how fussy I was that I'm allowed to go ahead and make my own <laughs> Anyway. So uh, I finished my PhD and then I went through another bit of a think and wonder what I wanted to do with my career. And so I thought, okay, let's do a one year trip. And that, those are all the countries I covered in one year. And at that time I was dealing with that. I did a, 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 a I think a job up, up in Colchester with Mark's uh, wife, Marion, who's also here as well, who I think tried to convince me to stay on um, because, I think <laughs> because I think apparently I was pretty good then. Um, and then I, I, there, were, there was a possibility of doing a postdoctoral at the NIH in Bethesda as well, following on my research. 
But the idea of going to Bethesda didn't sound too appealing to me. And then the Singapore offer came through and I was enticed back to Singapore. Um, and it was really to do a combination of stem cell transplant and clinical transfusion. Um, but at the time, I was really eager to translate my, my cell therapy research. And I wanted to think how I could build this up in Singapore uh, to, to run this into cell therapy trials. And I thought, ah, oh, working in a blood bank may be useful for this. And I think that was probably one of the best decisions I've made uh, in my life as well. Uh, and, and for those who don't know, I, that, that's the Singapore building I work in. It's called the Health Sciences Authority. It also houses the equivalent of the MHRA as well. So it's very useful to have the regulators there that I could talk to. And that's the picture of Singapore now. But I just want people to understand that this kind of picture that people are familiar with from crazy rich Asians <laughs> didn't exist when I went back. I think Singapore was still kind of trying to find its way, but it decided then that it would pump in a lot of money into the biomedical sector. And I think that was one of the reasons why I wanted to go back as well. So I went back and I worked with Diana, um, who, who I think is also on the call, uh, and, and who, was, who was the head of the whole National Blood Service, and I essentially became the deputy director. And I think that the, the, what I learned from transfusion medicine, really, in addition to being a, a, you know, that, was that they were experts at harvesting and processing cells. That's exactly what I wanted to do. You know, they, they did lots of high, high output apheresis. They were good at manufacturing blood in a GMP-like or good manufacturing practice-like environment in a closed system, exactly what I wanted to do for, for my cells. And they were able to, to characterize your red cells, your white cells, or your platelets by the different antigens. And I thought that that was also going to be important as we moved into cell therapy. And, and transfusion are, are, are pretty good you know, at, at keeping these cells alive, making sure they're transported well, labeled properly. There were donor protection issues, ethical issues. It was overall quality driven and process driven. And all these things I think were very, very useful in my learning curve um, in, in, in building up a cell therapy uh, program. And, and to this day, I remain a champion for, for transfusion. And as my colleagues from NHSBT will know, I still use them for, for our donor matching program and transplants. I still use them for stem cell processing as well. So thank you. Uh, thank you for coming today. Yeah, and so this is what we built. Um, and I think my whole team, as I said, it, it, is online now. So we've got several grant fundings and then really over the last 15 years, um, we have had significant grant funding initially from, from the equivalent of say the, the, the MRC. And then we went on to translational grants and finally the Department of Health gave us an operating grant. And we built a, um, a six room, a six clean room facility, two for gene therapy and four for for cell therapy, and all of that had air control environment with proper uh, um, 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 bits to make sure that air was controlled and our staff were, were appropriately dressed as well. And you can see that's them uh, uh, gowned up all the way uh, uh, handling cells as well. And really the, the ethos of course, as I've said, is that we were making, we were making cells as drugs or as a pill. And, and that was the aim, and that's my team here that I think was taken in this field. So in the last 15 years, that's what the, uh, the, the, the facility has been doing. We are fully uh, accredited uh, uh, internationally as well, both by JC and something called PICS, which really means that we are almost as if we are a drug manufacturer because that's what Pfizer and that's what Novartis get their accreditation with PICS as well. And we were supporting a, a national clinical trial work at that point. So we we were we were the, the place that you would come to if you were a researcher thinking of, of translating a cell or a gene therapy trial, and we would try to guide you through uh, the steps that were required to do this. And so my remit really in Singapore then was to build up a whole national ecosystem for cell therapy. And in doing so, really, I had to start from scratch. In fact, I got Mark Lodell to come back to Singapore to kind of assist me in a few things. Um, but we had to train manpower with, to deal with contracts and IP and legal framework issues. But overall, I think, and I, I'm, I'm very pleased to say that, that, you know, at the present moment, we have such a highly trained staff and, and team. They're able to provide a consultancy service all the way from start to, to the translation of, of, of the trial. And I could not have been have done the work we've done today without 
this team here. And some of them have been with me from the inception, from, from 15 years ago. And they're very, very well sought after by the pharma companies and by everybody else. Um, but it's it's testament to the work that we do that they still stay with, with, with us. So thank you. And again, I, I keep stressing back that, you know, when you're dealing with cell-based therapy, you obviously deal with risk of donation. We all know that, whether it's transfusion, transplants, we deal with that. We know that when it goes back into a patient, it can do different things. And again, we do know that as well. We also know what happens if the blood process is in poor quality or the transplant or the cell products of poor quality as well. And we also know that sometimes it can cause tumors if you're giving back stem cells as certainly. But we also worry that the manufacturing process is suboptimal. And that was something that I wanted to aim at and something that I wanted to, to make sure happens well. And so just a couple of nice pictures showing my team working uh, 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 with, with various instruments. And we try to make it as automated as possible like that. Some of you would know that's a, a new CAR-T machine that tries to do this in-house. And so that, that was really in the 2000s, but by 2009, I think I was lured back to the UK and St. George's, um, and that was to lead the transplant program. I think at that time I met Ted in, in Myanmar or Burma, uh, and Ted, like me, fairly international. I think we, we travel quite a bit. And and I think uh, uh, sorry I, I and I and I think that was taken at Ash, uh, uh, Ted. So uh, through the year through the years, I think we've had some kind of contact with one another. And, I, and, and Ted's work, of course, he, 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 he was leading a world-renowned program really focused on bone marrow failure that was, you know, that, 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 that was uh, uh, really cutting edge across the world. And to me, as Ted was retiring and, 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 and there was a time of flux in the department, it was an opportunity I thought that I would like to, to take hold of. And, and I remember actually just talking to Jenny this week uh, when Jenny said, oh, I do like new challenges and starting new things. And I said, I think that's exactly what I like to do as well. So I took this on and I knew that it would be hard work, but I couldn't leave Singapore behind because we were just at that bit that we were doing lots of good work as well. Um, and so I, 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 I was kind of batting, what, what should I do? Um, but anyhow, um, I somehow, and I'll talk about this a bit later, but I somehow managed, I think, to convince uh, St. George's and also Singapore uh, to let me split my job. I think no one really fully understood the details of it, and probably I still don't, um, but I think that was best kept that way. <laughs> anyway, so I came to St. George's, the department, and that's... Uh, Wonderful photo. I just found more preparing for this lecture. But I think Ted has not seen this for ages. But this was, I think, uh, the foundation from Lord um, Douglas Locke, I think, and his wife, who gave quite a lot of money to for machines and for, for the roof mounts, uh, a unit that hematology sits in. And of course, that's Joanna Lumley there. So I knew very early on that Ted and I mixed in very different social communities. <laughs> Um, but then we had a, and then I, we had a team then, and it was, a, it was not a, as big a team as it was then, uh, as it was now, as it is now, sorry. Uh, and, and essentially, I just want to point two people, uh, Fernanda Willis there, who was the, the lead for clinical hematology then. Um, she's away jaunting in South Africa, so I can give her that. Um, but he was very good and allowed me to, to, to take up this kind of two country, two job system. And um, and the other one is Dr. Matt Clamer here, who now will have handed over the transplant program to. And I have to say that Matt and I are completely different. Matt is methodical, precise, comprehensive, and detailed. And I was none of those. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, you always need opposites to gel. And I think the two of us worked very, very well together. And, and, and both Matt and Fidella were brilliant in helping me to manage my, my time across two countries. So I owe it to all of them, to, to, to really to both of them. And, I, and two little anecdotes about Matt. I, I think one day we discovered that we shared a, a, a common love for early German electronic music. So it was kind of craft work and before. That's really important. And the second thing that was even more, more and kind of thought, oh my gosh, that is the relevant thing, was uh, the fact that Matt, that's one of my favorite films, by the way, Rings of Desire, it, it's by Wim Wenders, a German uh, film, and Matt told me that he was one of the extras in that film. Yeah. <laughs> that says it all, so I think those were good moments for me. Anyhow, hey, um, so I think those were the key personnel really that held on at St. George's uh, through all these years as well. 
And so I was really quite keen to carry on the work that uh, had started. So we continued with our bone marrow failure program. We contributed to the British and to the European uh, societies and, 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 and managed to continue good practices and, and effective transplants. And, and actually, to this day, I always show this slide because this is the UK experience that currently someone with a life-threatening bone marrow failure, aplastic anemia syndrome, we are getting 90% cure rates. I mean, that's as good as you can get really in, in medicine and, and really in, in no small part from, from TED. And, and, and so that, that, that was a, a, a nice continuation of the work that we do uh, in the transplant centre. The other thing that I did notice very early on was that we had a very large hemoglobinopathy population with us being a multi-ethnic uh, population here. And at that time, really, sickle cell was a fairly neglected disease. There were no new drugs available at all. And, the, you know, it, it, it was painful to watch them with a whole host of chronic complications uh, uh, suffer from, from their disease. And there was, by that time, filtering through from, from Johns Hopkins, a new, completely new technique of curing sickle cell with a transplant using a very, very low-dose chemotherapy-free regimen. And I was interested in that. So they had just published in an abstract, a small series, and I went to speak to them, and, and, and we brought it back, and, and we treated the first patient in the UK, the adult patient, uh, uh, for this. I asked for his permission to show his face, and he's always very, very proud to be the first patient. There was a lot of press around. It, of course, uh, but to this day he's cured and, and living a normal life. And, and so that's where we are as well with, sick, uh, with transplants and with non-malignant disease. And, I, I, and I've been predicting this all this while, and I say it again, that the, the transplants are changing, that the face of transplants will move more and more into the non-malignant, into the congenital diseases uh, where there's no cure for all. And, 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 we then, and, and that, I think, is the age freezes unit collecting stem cells from a patient. And so that was a Nature article that we, we were talking, uh, it was a commentary really that uh, we contributed about what the state of, of stem cells would be. Um, and that's just a quick slide to say that really transplants, it's a beguiling mix, I think, of the very, very heavily protocolized because everything we do is by a certain protocol. And yet you're dealing with the kind of protein manifestations of an immune system that you cannot predict. And I think it's that clash that, that always provided challenges for me. And as we increasingly did more and more challenging transplants, we had to think about the whole pathway of these patients, starting from collecting their the donor cells all the way to a lifelong follow-up. So I've seen patients of mine get married, have children, and it's very gratifying from the transplant that you have done. And, 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 and I'm, again, very proud to say that we always outperform the average cohort in, in the British uh, uh, transplant kind of centre, and we always do a bit better in terms of our survival. And I always say that that's because we are a moderate-sized transplant programme, which is consultant-led, and, and we do not kind of farm out our patients back uh, uh, on, on, on long-term follow-up, we see them and we carefully monitor them. Okay. So very quick. Um, at this point, I really wasn't in response to Jenny's question. I really wasn't sure how long it was going to last. I did think that I, I should find a successor in Singapore, um, but then the job was enjoyable, and so I carried on. And who doesn't want a bit of sun and a bit of warmth going to be there? <laughs> and my mom's food. So I had insurance. <laughs> so I think that continued to be a draw factor. And actually, it worked quite well because it gave me a very, very unique overview of health systems that were completely diverse. Uh, and, and we had good bits in the UK that I wish were transported to Singapore and vice versa. But, but that really is, is um, the, the subject of another lecture altogether. But essentially, I spent six weeks in London and a week or so in Singapore for those people. Who want to know, and I've been doing that for the last 15 years. Um, although finally, I think I am in the stages of, of, of slowly uh, reducing my Singapore commitment and kind of placing emphasis on St. George's because I think that the time is right now to, to, to develop some programs here. So that's my next uh, couple of years. Um, and at the same time, you know, I, I couldn't leave what I did in the PhD lab. So in Singapore, we continued with. Uh, 
expansion uh, um, and sort of translational research, and we continue looking at natural killer cells. We wanted to see how we could grow them and what we could do to add function to them. And, and we even ran them in a small clinical trial uh, uh, with something called cytokine induced killer cells to see whether they could reduce relapse. So it was a nice time of, of balancing a very operational job of, of trying to build up a, a program. And not only that, but being very, very, very safe because we couldn't manufacture a product that was not safe. And then also having a team that could uh, embark upon a bench and translational research. And so uh, uh, that was a fairly productive time, I think, for me at that time, between 2010 to 15 or so. Um, and, and just an idea of what we make currently, that's me, by the way, I didn't recognize myself, but that's me down down. And that's a, a sort of car tea machine that tries to simplify how you make car tea. So, and, and that is the current product that's being made in the um, in the facility now in partnership with Hong Kong, and it's uh, osteochondral cartilage for for damaged cartilage uh, uh, in patients with sports injuries. So that's uh, and, and that is after I think I can't remember 20, 21 days of growth, and you actually get this kind of almost sponge like uh, uh, material that looks like cartilage. Uh, uh, we grow dendritic cells, we grow various types of stem cells, uh, and and we try to have an Asian focus as well. So we look at Hepatitis B, for example, we look at nasopharyngeal carcinomas, and we grow up, and, and we, we have our own in-house CAR T uh, program as well. Um, and, and, and just very quickly for people who don't know CAR T, this really has been the paradigm shift that, that kind of accelerated cell and gene therapy uh, to the stratosphere that uh, I would say five, six years ago. And what happened was that they looked at a T cell, an immune cell. And if you just change something on, the, on, on its surface and what it recognized by using genetic modification, you could suddenly target leukemias that previously was not responding to anything at all, including transplants. And we are now, with CAR T therapy, you're achieving cures of up to even 70%. But it comes with it a lots of life-threatening side effects, and that is the problem. And so really, when you're dealing with stem cells or with immune therapy, you're dealing with the good and the bad as well, the two phases of, the, of, 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 of a therapy. But the other thing that I always highlight and that the paradigm shift is that it really is the first time where there's a manufacturing partnership because the hospital requires the cells to make the product. If they don't have the cells, they can't make it. And so they have to come to us and inspect us. And then we, we, we move into a partnership so that patient cells are collected, given to them to manufacture, brought back, and then delivered into the patient itself. So it, it, it really is a bespoke autologous therapy. And you think about it, is that how medicine is going? I'm not sure, but we'll talk about that if we have time later. But certainly it's expensive, more than 500,000 uh, for a single infusion, uh, um, and, and clearly uh, uh, difficult uh, in terms of getting parts uh, of, of the world to, to access this. And, and we're seeing good results in autoimmune disease. So I'm, I'm, the rheumatologists are keen to, to think about using this as well. So I think in my time at St. George's thus far, I think we really now have a, a mature, I think, a, a transplant program. I, I think we've got a fantastic myeloma program led by Fenella, uh, Yasmin and Theodora, and, 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 and a lymphoma program as well. And again, I, re I, I remember what Ted told me. He said, never think of transplants as, as sitting by itself. Never think of it as in, in isolation. It should sit as part of the continuum of treatment. And I think that that's why, again, we do well, because we have patients that have been treated well on the myeloma, the lymphoma, the leukemia program that come to us. And I'm grateful to many colleagues here, Sisha from Radiology, Tehana uh, uh, from IID, who support us uh, uh, with our very sick patients. And, and, and we have our dedicated psychologists, physiotherapists. Helen is here as well. Again, I'm grateful. And, and we run a, 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 an apheresis team that collects these stem cells. And so the transplants are now embedded not only into our blood cancer program, but really into our sickle cell program as well. And increasingly so in neurology, because we do multiple sclerosis. And recently, we have been also kind of extending our fingers into rheumatology by doing uh, a difficult rheumatology patient as well. So overall, I hope this bit of the talk, I've shown you the good that we've got a proven, established stem cell therapy. Clearly, there are bad things that happened in terms of life-threatening graft versus host disease, in terms of relapse and acquiescent stem cell, uh, uh, and, and how, do, you know, but, but, but clearly the field is established, it's mature, and it's moved on from there.
And so I then moved on from there to thinking about effective clinical practice worldwide. And that has also been the next bit of focus of my work. So together with, with international colleagues, we've published quite a lot of uh, uh, what I would say real world guidelines uh, for people managing through their whole transplant process. And we also wanted to make sure that this was this had a, a worldwide focus rather than the usual usual European or American focus as well. So these have been taken on quite well, um, I know, by many countries, and, and, and they really range from donors uh, published in the Lancet Hematology to, to managing COVID during uh, uh, transplants during COVID as well. So guidelines and, and safe practice uh, uh, became an important part of my job. And then that kind of led me into thinking about starting transplant programs worldwide. Uh, I mentioned that, I, I, you know, so sometimes in, 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 when I'm invited to give a talk, for example, in different countries like Ted does, um, I see the problem there and they come and ask me about, you know, starting a, 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 a transplant program. And I then learned that it was important not to dictate Western norms to them over what should be done and what should not be done, but that actually country needs were important and that you may think a country, you know, might think, oh gosh, you know, how can, how can they have a stem cell transplant program when, when, when uh, there's so many other bits of healthcare that are lacking. But that's not entirely true all the time because sometimes there really is a need uh, uh, to have a transplant program because equivalently bone marrow failures, which is rare in developed countries, is actually very, very common in developing countries. And I never forget the day I was shown this picture in Myanmar. The hematologist showed me they, they had a whole ward of patients with empty bone marrows, aplastic anemia, neutrophil count of zero. And she said, and she showed me all of them lived in this part of the country that was on the effluent bit of the river. And that river led up to a chemical plant. And anybody that lived upstream from there did not have aplastic anemia. And that kind of struck home to me very, very clearly, you know, that and, and that no way of treating these patients because aplastic anemia, you either have to use expensive drugs or you do a transplant. And so I thought, yes, there is a need. So I worked quite hard with them. And, and I always, again, stress that safe blood transfusion is mandatory. And so I've done numerous visits to Myanmar. I've done programs, for example, in Sri Lanka. I'm doing one now in Ethiopia, um, which we started a couple of years, about six, seven years ago, and then stopped because of the civil war, but now it's restarted again. Um, and we also uh, uh, invite, and, and we've got the Jamaican trainees and Egyptian trainees who come across to us uh, uh, for their fellowships as well. So that was my way of, I think, thinking of how we could get worldwide access to what I think really is essential therapy. And I just want to show you, this is what the transplant room in, in Burma looks like. They had a portable HEPA filter. They had a steamer, a portable steamer. And they had, you know, they had to monitor their own temperature and they did their own water treatment. And so it really was born out of a need, but really ingenious, low cost. And I'm very, very pleased to say they have started their program. It has run reasonably well. And in fact, as you saw, they highlighted this in one of the ASH oral sessions and it has since been published. So I'm, I'm very pleased, I think, with that bit of the work. Um, and then I'm, I, I work quite a lot in, in an international society called WA, uh, WBMT that, it, that partners uh, WHO as well. So we really have access to data worldwide. And at the moment in counting, we've done one and a half million transplants so far. But more importantly, it gives us access to data across a huge data set of patients. That's, the I think, the largest data set of myeloma patients ever, more than 60,000. And we also looked at how uh, acute myeloid leukemia was being treated. So that was uh, a lot of large data crunching, but again, very... Um, very satisfying, and 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 in doing so, again, we stressed worldwide access, we stressed training, and so we've had uh, uh, workshops and, and and training programs together with the WHO across different parts of the world. Um, I don't think anybody can say it's hard work when you go from Hanoi to um, Brazil down to South Africa. So that was fun. <laughs> but in doing so, we also set up different articles to try to help them to 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 set up these programs as well. Okay, so I think that that's what I'm going to cover for stem cells. In the last five to 10 minutes, I'm going to come back to the newer bits of stem cells and try to kind of present to you the promise of these stem cells. Now, I think all of you, and I point out that slide, but you know, you get a primitive cell that can divide into everything. 
But I think all of us would, would probably understand that, you know, life is unidirectional. You're born, you get older, and then the inevitable happens. And as you mature and differentiate, you can't go back. That is your mantra of life. And that was your one-way directional differentiation and aging. The story of iPSC cells or induced pluripotent stem cell upended the entire argument. And this was a Nobel Prize winning discovery of Yamanaka, um, who showed that if you took someone's skin cells, someone's skin cell, you give them just four different factors. It was OC4 and CMYK2. You could turn the clock and these patients be and these cells that were skin cells became stem cells. And from these stem cells, you could then grow heart tissue, you could grow neurons, you could grow connective tissue. And so suddenly that future was limitless. But clearly, if you think again, you know, one of the factors of CMYK, what is CMYK? We know that that drives lots of tumors. And we don't know what these things do. So we are still trepidatious. There are trials going on in Japan for this, for macular degeneration. The Japanese obviously have invested a huge amount of money into it. I have to say that at the current point in time, it has not brought in revenue. And I think that it's still rather experimental, but I think it is about to take off. And then we also learn that stem cells, because they could engraft easily and well, really could be used as a carrier. You could carry genes. And so if someone had a congenital problem, congenital disease like hemophilia or sickle cell, you could use your stem cell to carry that corrected gene into the body and cure this patient. And that's where I think transplants are going to go. It's not going to be curing leukemias because we're going to get more and more new drugs and leukemias, but it's going to be a nice vehicle to introduce whether it's DNA, RNA, genes into a person as well. But but I but I always bring up this IPSC story because it's the whole idea of, of, of life really is upended. Um, and then in my kind of usual way, I, I got interested then in this whole idea of stem cells because I then read the stem cell because it was easy. If you remember, right, if you remember, I told you that these hematopoietic stem cells were easy to collect. And true enough, because they were easy to collect, there were lots of stem cell clinics out there that collected these stem cells and use them in a whole variety of different conditions. And you go to websites in, in various uh, uh, bits while well, privately run, you'll see very flashy websites that tell you they can cure anything from alopecia to, to, new, uh, to, 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 to a stroke, to Parkinson's, to dementia as well. And, and the media, of course, continue to hype this up and say how wonderful stem cells are. And then there was a group of people, a group of researchers who then came up slowly and, and asked for more and more proof and regulation. One of them was Doug, and I sourced him out, and together we had a quite nice chat. We decided to take this a little bit further. Um, and at the same time, I think the FDA were also recognizing this problem. In the New England or Journal, for example, New, Eng uh, New England Journal of Medicine, for example, there were inadvertent tumors developing in patients who got their stem cell treatment in another country. Imagine a logistical nightmare. You go across to Mexico and get your treatment. You come back and you have a tumor. Who pays and what happens? So it was all of these issues. And it's because we don't know enough of these stem cells and we don't know enough of this cell therapy. So we cannot assume that they can be used safely without running them in proper clinical trials. That was the one thing they needed to do. But on the other hand, it was such an easy money maker that it blossomed, you know, stem cell clinics. Um, yeah, and, and so it led to this whole field of unproven therapies where I stress, it does not mean it's ineffective. I always say they show promise. And it is just that they're not proven because we don't fully understand them completely. And now we see stem cells popping up all over the place. I mean, I remember being up on the plane once, looking through the duty free catalog, and look, and behold, there is an intensive phase screen with lots of stem cells in it. I'm not sure if it works. And, then, and people now go into clinics where they get their liposuction done, a fat stem cells are taken out and then injected back into the face. And that's what's happening worldwide. So we it was a problem that we had to deal with. And so we decided that we needed to empower people because when we tried to sort of say, no, you can't do it, we had a lot of patient groups coming back to us and saying, oh gosh, you know, you cannot be doing this. It's our right to, 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 to want to be treated if we want to, especially because many of these diseases were had, had no other 
choices left. You know, if you transected your, your, your spinal cord, there was no therapy for you. And so you could understand why these patients would spend thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of pounds to try to get a stem cell injection. So we decided that it was important to, to kind of empower them. And we also then drew a map every year of, of products that are approved, that are proven, and so that people could use this as a resource that they could come to and decide what treatment they would have. And then we then even went further. We went across to lots of different organizations, including EBMT, uh, uh, the American Society. We went to the Stem Cell Research Society, which notoriously always operates by itself. But we managed to, to, to get up a 32-page position paper, sent it to the WHO, which actually ended up getting quite a bit of traction, I'm very pleased to note, and ended up, if you can see in, their, in, in one of their recent initiatives when they looked at human genome editing, was to look at um, international research and medical travel. So clearly it was something that was on the WHO radar and, they, and, and was something that they wanted to focus uh, clearly upon it. And this really started the, the whole process of me uh, uh, working with the WHO. Um, and in the last kind of three, four minutes, because I think we're running out of time, um, I've since, uh, uh, I spent about two weeks a year uh, working with the WHO as part of the expert committee on biological standardization. It's two weeks a year, but then we spent almost a month before that, plowing through, I think, really quite technical documents. And if you ask me what we deal with, it's astonishing the, the way, I mean, we deal with vac today. In fact, it's happening this week. I've just finished a virtual call. The vaccine work we're dealing with, with uh, safety and, and, and licensing of rotor vaccines. We're looking at cancer drugs, the Tuximab, which is a monoclonal antibody, and, and setting an international standard so that we can measure the potency of these drugs. We, we look at uh, uh, setting up an international standard for, 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 your, for your various clotting factors, because we want to make sure that laboratories across the world, when they measure a factor eight level in hemophilia, are consistent across the world. And so in doing so, the WHO releases out these international reference reagents or international standards. And, and so we sit as a panel to assess the work that goes into it, the testing that goes into it, how sensitive, how specific it is, what the po false positivity and negativities are, what the clinical implications are. And then we always want to make sure that there's a worldwide spread because that's important for WHO. We want, and we are, ably, very, very ably advised by technical experts. And so often I feel like an imposter in there because we're dealing with infectious disease. You know, we're dealing with, with for example, lentiviral integration copy numbers, but, I, but with their assistance and, and actually in return, they want to see the clinical side of things. They want to see the, 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 the kind of practical side of things and how we apply this on a day to day. So that complementary expertise has proved to be very, very useful. And each meeting that we have, uh, we release a document which um, which is called technical, uh, a technical uh, report, which runs into 200 pages long. Uh, uh, and unfortunately, it's been my task the last two or three years together with uh, a, a, a more senior partner to, to come up with this. So that is the hard work, uh, but it is rewarding work. And and that's, and, and I've, again, I have to say, you know, my, my time in the lab, in the PhD lab has prepared me for that kind of ability to look through these technical documents and not be completely faced by them. Because it's not something that I, it, it comes naturally to me as a clinician as well. I think we'll forget about this um, on that as well in the interest of time. So I think really in my last two slides, we are moving towards a tech, an age where we've got 3D printing, we've got CRISPR, we've got anti-aging, stem cell biology, regenerative medicine. And we need to ask ourselves, are we moving more and more into making more and more of these autologous bespoke products that are expensive? And where are they going to be made? Or can we end up with cell-based products almost mass-produced, a little bit like pills and pharmaceutical products these days? And we always have to think about access and cost because the world cannot afford this, as the Financial Times has rightly written. And I end up by sort of just showing that that's the kind of sequence of events or research and, and interest that I've been involved with. And it's a little bit like that lamp, which is con consists of lots of disparate parts that you kind of gelled it together into a into one beautiful uh, artwork. I put that up because uh, it is actually done by, by a design collective that I've got lateral interest in, not financial, but lateral. Yeah. So if anybody's interested in that, come and speak to me. Price on arrival. <laughs> and finally, my clothing slide. That's my next interest now is making olive oil. 
um, as Ted knows, in, in my little farmhouse in Spain, and that's what we collect every day. So maybe that will be the next high-tech revolution that comes along. So thank you all for listening. I hope that I've, I've managed to kind of cover ground that all of you would have found some interest in, and I think I went a little bit above over time. Thank you. Exhausted. <laughs> How many times have you been around the world, as it were? Um, unfortunately, we, 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 unfortunately, this is a sort of lecture you can't have questions, but the obvious one is how did you get hold of the anti aging stuff? <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, there we go. Dear colleagues, dear friends, here in London, in Singapore, in Malaysia, I hope, in uh, America. Uh, Welcome to, to this occasion, and I hope you will join me in giving great thanks to Mickey for this particular splendid talk, which is given to celebrate his uh, appointment as professor, of course, and perhaps in some ways to show why he deserves it. Uh, he certainly does. <laughs> <laughs> the, um, uh, but, but I'm not going to dwell on his, his, work, his, his work as shown in the lectures, but to give a personal opinion and thanks for all he's done here at St George's, because it's his inaugural lecture here, uh, which is wonderful. Uh, one tends to think that in the gloomiest and darkest of skies and moments, there may be a tiny beam, a little, sh little beam, a ray of sunshine. I hesitate to call Mickey a ray of sunshine, or at least a ray of anything else, but certainly at the time he was appointed, the skies over St George's were extremely gloomy and indeed there was considerable concern that it, the transplant unit might not be able to continue. And I have to say that Mickey's appointment uh, was actually welcomed with great enthusiasm, we thought almost to be a miracle that such a person could come at that particular moment to deal with the problems of licensing, of standardization and so on, which clearly Mickey had in spades, as it were, uh, from his work in Singapore and, uh, of course, elsewhere. I think all of us have benefited from uh, from that work, that part of your work. And of course, as you will know, uh, he, oh, well, we just heard, he spends an awful lot of time in the air, toppling around from one place to another. There, there is the old joke, of course, that you, that uh, a definition of a professor is someone who will turn bullshit into air miles. <laughs> It might be true, but certainly not uh, true of, of Mickey, not at all. Uh, and he, he, he coped with the registration of our, our uh, transplant work uh, with consummate skill, with huge patience. It takes vast amounts of planning and replanning and resubmitting and so on to get it done. And he showed his wonderful patience and often very good, or usually very good humour, uh, sometimes a bit on the black side, <laughs> but uh, very good humour in dealing with all this, which was absolutely marvellous. Uh, I, I think we probably should uh, um, more or less finish up, otherwise I shall start to get really uh, over-enthusiastic about your, your, uh, your work. <laughs> of course, how does he, he manage to fly around the world with such enthusiasm and so little sleep? Um, it's not quite sure, sure because he, he clearly doesn't need a lot of sleep. He work, you work, I don't know how many hundreds of hours, and not 168, which is what you used to have to work as an SHO and as a house officer. Uh, but anyway, a vast amount, which is all to the benefit of St. George's uh, and, and hematology in the UK and maybe hematology worldwide. Everything you do, uh, is, which is to do with standardization which sounds sometimes a bit boring, but is absolutely essential uh, to the practice of our specialty, which, is, which has always been wonderful. No slides, you notice, but of course I have to uh, change, things, change things around. So not so much a little ray of sunshine, or a thundering great beam of light that goes around the world, dazzling and illuminating and uh, inspiring wherever you come to earth. And that's, uh, that's been a, a wonderful thing for us. Uh, 
We hope that you will continue with enthusiasm and little sleep, but don't surrender. St. George is, uh, is grateful for all you've done since you came, for all you're doing now, and of course, for your, what you're going to do in the future. So don't surrender, don't sleep. <laughs> Come back and thank you, Mickey, for being such a wonderful colleague and companion. Thank you. He wants 10 seconds, so don't deny him. <laughs> I forgot to thank the people that are really are important. My Singapore team, led by Marietta and Madeline, that's a WBNT team that I've worked with for lots of international uh, my work. That's one of the versions of the transplant team, and that's some of the WHO personnel that we track quite a lot with. So thank you again. <laughs> here to wrap up proceedings uh obviously the most enormous thanks there are some days when you're a university vice chancellor that not are unalloyed joy but tonight <laughs> was an episode of joy thank you so much for being one of our professors and for bringing us all together please join us for a drink and a little bit of refreshment next door thank you.